Hey there, this is Darren Smith, and welcome to another episode of the Craftsman Creative Podcast. This is another workshop, and today my co-host is Andrew Camphy, at Camphy on Twitter. And this guy has built businesses, started businesses, sold businesses, exited businesses. He is just an all-around creator and has a depth of experience, which is pretty crazy. So Andrew currently runs bettersheets.co, and it's a great resource for people who want to learn how to better use Google Sheets. I'm a member, I've bought his products, I'm a fan, I'm a follower, I'm a friend. So I'm really excited that we got him on the show to chat and to do a deep dive on building these businesses. So we talked about a, a number of different things, but in this one, you'll hear us talk about the difference in how we approach the, uh, the idea of a portfolio of small bets whether to go deep on one product or to have a series of products or a, a whole suite of products, a portfolio of products, so to speak. We talk about how he approaches building a business, starting a business, coming up with a new idea. We talk a little bit about audience growth. We talk about a lot of things in this episode. So I'm really excited for you. It's a good one. And if you are not yet a subscriber to the Craftsman Creative newsletter, it's a newsletter I put out every Monday with just a couple of things. So it's notifies you of new podcast episodes, new blog posts, new updates with Craftsman Creative as I'm building in public and showing you how to build a six-figure creative business. So go and subscribe. It's free. It costs you nothing. It comes out every Monday. And I guarantee there's going to be something in there every week that will help you grow your business to six figures as well. Again, go sign up at craftsmancreative.co. And now on to the episode. Man, this uh, conversation has been a long time coming, I think. I've been following you for a while. I think you've been following me for a while, which is awesome. Thank you. And you've been a big supporter of like all the things that I put out on Twitter randomly. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, but man, oh man, we're going to talk about some fun stuff. We're going to go deep on building creative businesses and creative products. And man, I'm just excited because I love uh, your personality your tone online like you don't kind of hold back you're just like this is how it is <laughs> yeah. I, I mean we're all in this thing together aren't we like and if i can make it easier for other people that ha are coming in the same path in the same on the same railway and um isn't that a nice thing to do but also like i think uh we're better together than fighting against each other, I guess. Yes, completely agree. But I remember like you, you asked if, you know, for people to what podcast you can come on. I was like, dude, let's chat. And you're like, F yeah. I was like, okay, I love this guy. <laughs> so um, for those that are here in the audience, we can't see you. So I'm not quite sure uh, where you are or <laughs> how, how that part works. It uh, looks like there's a chat, so feel free to like ask questions of us. And about 30 minutes or so, we'll dive into some Q&A and answer any questions that people have. So uh, this is also live streaming, I think, to Facebook and YouTube if I set it up right, but I'm not monitoring those. So if people ask questions there, uh, sorry, you'll need to hop over to Riverside and say hi there. So go to my Twitter and click on the link and come over here. I, I will fix that system and improve it over time. But this is the first one of these on Riverside that I've been doing. So we're flying the plane. Uh, let's just building. dive in. Say it again. We're flying the plane as we're building it. Oh, yeah. Open for business during construction is how <laughs> I like to phrase it. <laughs> All right. So here's what we're chatting about. Um, these workshops are fun because I call them workshops because I like to deep dive on stuff rather than do interview style. Like, my opinion is that n there's not enough people in the world who care about me and my backstory and like all of that upbringing and stuff like that. And it's not super valuable. What's valuable is like tactically and strategically what I'm doing right now to build creative businesses and help other creators build creative businesses. And it sounds like you do a lot of the same. And so that's what we're going to deep dive on for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, we're going to talk about... Um, building creative businesses and creative products. So we were chatting back and forth. Um, here's where I'd love to start, Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, the Tilt, I don't know if you know Joe Polizzi and the people at thetilt.com. Um, they ran Creator Economy Expo that I was at just a few weeks ago in Phoenix, Arizona. But they did this cool um, survey of creators. They did like a couple thousand creators, wow. took this survey and filled out their answers about like 
where they're at in their business, how much money they make, how long they've been at it, all this kind of stuff. And the one um, point that they keep harping on, they mentioned it like twice during the conference and they've brought it up in their newsletter before is like, is that it takes 18 months on average for creators to start making like a decent revenue from their creative work. And I kind of scoff at that because I've created products in a weekend and launched them the next week and started making money. Like I've done consulting work and then like made one phone call and had people, you know, willing to pay me thousands of dollars. So like the idea that it takes 18 months to start making money to me is like, yeah, that might be true for a lot of people, but we got to fix that. So what's your take on that? And, and maybe what's your experience in like how you build products and your approach to how you kind of craft those, how quickly you want to start making money, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I, I believe the 18 month mark because anecdotally every creative project I've ever had has been at minimum a 12 month endeavor to get it to a point where, Oh, we can do something with this. Uh, and in the creative world, like at least in YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, when, when you're not running a business and and tweeting about it, but rather trying to create a Twitter business, it takes a year to figure out what to do, how to monetize, um, if you're doing it at first. And then I think once you get on a roll, um, once you have a win in your pocket, you you either double down, triple down on that, or you know what the winning strategy is and you just keep doing it. Um, I think now, to your point though, is that there are, uh, there's a power law at, at force here, right? Um, there are places where people are going to buy things immediately. And if you can get in front of them, uh, they're going to buy what you're doing. They're going to buy your creative service, buy your creative output, create uh, your product. Um, and they're marketplaces, right? So I was very successful with AppSumo Marketplace. Um, a month after I launched Better Sheets, uh, and it's still going now. So these kinds of things, for some people, they have like an S curve or yeah, they, they like, you can launch and then it sort of levels out. Um, but you can also launch again and again and again, launch different products, launch to new audiences. Um, you, you can launch in many different ways over and over again. Mm -hmm. All right. So you can start making money, but like you said, maybe there's, uh, a time that you should expect it to take to figure out that winning strategy to kind of dial in on the offer, the audience, the product, everything that's working together and having it go pretty smoothly at that point. Yeah. And then some people also have an unfair advantage, right? And th th there's sort of the idea that everybody has a certain unfair advantage and some of it is in our brain. Some of it is in our networking. Some of it is in our family. Like, there are people, there are certain people in Hollywood who have been in Hollywood since the day where they were born. And that is their unfair advantage. Um, <coughs> Coppola's. <coughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I've certainly felt that in my career. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then there's unfair advantages like, like Googling Google Sheets every day for five years. Like, I had the unfair advantage that I was working in a startup and in two weeks I built, I wrote one Google script that we ended up using for five years. I ended up fixing that and, and fixing it up and making it better and better and using Google sheets to run an entire startup television network over the course of five years and every single day, like including weekends, by the way, like every single day I would Google for something and learn something every day, five years of it of just learning one little tiny thing every day, that's an unfair advantage, right? And and I think that is 100% why Better Sheets has been successful is because I can tell that story too, right? I can say like, oh, I was being paid $75,000 a, a year just to do Google Sheets. And like, then you can get my knowledge for like this X price, right? Like anything under $75,000 is like, you're winning. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's brilliant. And I think that's such a smart approach to coming up with product ideas is where is your unfair advantage? Um, when I started Craftsman Creative two years ago, the pandemic had just hit. 
and everybody shut down. Everybody went home. Uh, we, I, got, I got furloughed from the TV show I was a senior producer on. No events were happening. No gigs were happening. Nobody was hiring people for projects and stuff like that. And I went, well, what am I going to do now? Am I going to sit on my thumbs and wait or am I going to make something? And the first question I asked myself was, okay, well, what can I do with the skills that I have and the constraints that currently exist, which is we're not getting together. We're not filming TV shows. We're not doing any of that stuff. So I started making online courses. I'd always wanted to, and I'd thought about it, but never had the time because I was working on a TV show. And so I was like, shoot, I can finally have time to do this stuff. And, you know, a few weeks later, I had a course. And a week after that, I had a few thousand dollars in my bank account. And then I went out and made another one with a friend here in Provo. And she has a 10 times the audience and platform that I have. We made a course together, put it on the site. And a month after initially talking to her, she did 10 grand in sales a month after the pandemic had started. And so like, um, that's kind of where I balk at that stat a little bit because I think sometimes it prevents people from thinking that they can A, make something that can make money online and B, that it's going to take forever. So why even try? Or I don't have that time or I don't have that patience. And my response is, look, it may take, like you said, a a year or two years to kind of figure it out and turn it into a real business that's functioning and has systems and is optimized. But the idea that you can't make money online is like a false one. So I would love to hear kind of your thoughts on that. Like, where are people getting it wrong? Whether it doesn't have to be necessarily directly connected to that statistic, but I mean, you spend a lot of time making products and you Mm -hmm. are on Twitter and you're active there and you're seeing everybody that's making another how to grow on Twitter course and all this stuff. But like, what are the, what's the thing that artists are and creatives and entrepreneurs are doing wrong or getting wrong as they're, you know, strategically approaching this stuff. Well, one thing just to comment on the last sort of unfair advantage is, unfortunately, uh, we're like the worst people uh, to know our own unfair advantage, right? We don't know it, it because it's easy for us, right? Um, you, you and I actually, it's so funny, this is like a, a similarity right here, is like we, we're both producers of video and we have been for many years and I've been a very much a failed video producer. I failed in actually getting a job in, in Hollywood, even though I worked on like, like freelance gigs and stuff. And then the startup job I had was like, yeah, we were in Los Angeles, but we were definitely not in Hollywood. We were, we were making broadcast television in sub-Saharan Africa and India and Poland. Um, And Also, I had a failed YouTube channel. And so like ultimately making video was like easy for me because I've done it, but I failed at a business. (laughs) Um, And you though were very, you were successful, you were senior producer. And then you like, were like, oh, I'm going to go make a video course because I make video. Like, I don't think either of us, you or me knew at the moment we were starting that like that was our unfair advantage. But like it is hard to make video it is yeah emotionally difficult it is mentally difficult it is physically difficult um you just spoke about constraints and i gave myself the sort of best and worst constraint possible when i started better sheets is i uh only made loom videos so screen shares and i said i'm not gonna edit because i've edited for my entire life i've been on <laughs> adobe premiere i learned avid i worked on cruise wow. ships where I had to use Avid editing system every every day. And I was like, I don't want to edit anymore. And so for the last two years, unfortunately, Better Sheets members are like watching these unedited raw screen share videos. And it's beautiful, right? Like I've been able to produce four or 500 videos. 177 of those are available for all members sometimes. It's so easy for me to turn on Loom record that I just send a Loom video to one person. I'll I'll make a 5, 10, 20 minute Loom video showing someone how to do something and send it to one person and and feel great about it because I didn't have to edit. I sat there, exposed my knowledge, and that person was like, oh my God, this is so great. Like, this is perfect. I've I've been waiting three three years to figure this out. Wow. Yeah, that's 
I mean, that's amazing. And I think we benefit from the fact that we're in, you know, coming out of or in the middle of the pandemic, however you like phrasing it, because a lot of people lowered their bar of what counts for good video content, right? I mean, even <laughs> big, brands, big, big brands were like, and I'm not trying to discount the, the value you've created, right? Mm-hmm. But like even big brands are, were strategically filming Zoom-like or phone-like mm-hmm. video content for Super Bowl ads or for, you know, mm-hmm. national commercials because they were trying to fit in with whatever was going on during the pandemic and make it look more familiar. And so I've had this conversation a lot um, over the last two years, which is like, if you want to do video stuff, there's never been a better time because the bar is so low. People are used to being on Zoom and having video mm-hmm. breakup and audio problems and buffering and dropped calls. So if you've got this level of lighting and sound quality, like that's fine. I mean, I'm using an upgraded camera and an upgraded microphone. You don't have to do that. I filmed um, entire, like during the pandemic, a friend of mine who's a realtor started doing uh, video walkthroughs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was bored and had nothing to do. So I was like, sure, I'll help you out and charge you some money to like film a video. And I gave myself similar constraints. I said, I'm going to film these on my phone because... I want them to be easy. I want them to be like small file size. And I want it to be something where if I go back to the TV show, because this is all, you know, picking back up, I want to be able to hand it off and not need the Mm -hmm. other person to have to have like a 5D Mark IV or some cinema camera or some high-end gear. It's like, no, literally take your iPhone and a little $200 clip on road mic and you can make an entire video. And she was making, you know, an extra 15 grand a house because she had video walkthroughs and stuff. I'm like, okay, you know, there, there's never been a better time. So maybe that uh, transitions us nicely into something else I wanted to chat with you about, which is just like your um, framework or strategy or your the way that you approach your business. Because is Better Sheets a, a s- single product or do you have lots of products? Like, how do you think about your business? And Maybe we could tie it in with this idea of there's um, Daniel Vassallo has famously um, coined this phrase, a portfolio of small bets for creators, which means you go out and you just kind of make a lot of different products Mm -hmm. and a see what sticks, but also it's like a diversified portfolio strategy, right? If you're investing, you want to diversify. It's kind of like diversifying across products. I have some opinions there, but I'm curious, like, what's your take on that approach how do you see like building your business and your products? Yeah, I think of it more like side projects, not small bets. Like what I'm about to say may be completely wrong, but I feel like the small bets theory is you create completely different products for completely different audiences for completely different uses. And I think that that, uh, waters down our abilities it never allows for compound uh increases you can never work on something twice and it like consistently and twice and three times and and really build something whereas uh side projects uh are one you you just said it in in how you created your project it's like i can hand this off i can stop it i can it's not a new thing that i'm doing completely and i have to focus my entire time and energy to, um, but that it also helps what you're doing, right? Like, um, now I go off this many times, right? So, um, I have a lot of weird ideas. I come up with ideas easily. And I think that's an, unfortunately a curse and a blessing. So I have to sneeze. That's what I'm, um, <laughs> do it <laughs> like, as, as I was saying before, like an unfair advantage of mine is that I can think of things very divergently and like think of many different ways and aspects of it. And so when I'm working on something, I'm like, is this the best way to do it? Oh, I wonder if I did it this other way. And then the next day I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it this other way. And it hurts me in exactly the same way that it hurts small bets, right? Is like, just work on one thing, keep building it, building, building it. And I didn't even learn this lesson two years ago, I learned this lesson like months ago. <laughs> like, I 
<laughs> I started Better Sheets as a side project, knowing that I wanted to build SaaS companies. I had a co-founder of a company that I was working on that failed. I had worked on my own on a, a, a website and a company that failed. And then I bought a SaaS and I got a baby and I was like, I can't handle this and all this other stuff. So I sold that. And then after all of that, after like a year and a half of better sheets and it's going well, there was a three months into it. Every single person I ever talked to would have said, just go a hundred percent in on that a year into it. Everybody else would have said, go a hundred percent into that. But I was insecure. I was like, I, it's a bunch of loom videos. I I'm embarrassed about it. I don't think I can do this. And I didn't realize that I should be going 200% in on that. And then I got a full-time job and I was like, I can handle this. I had an ego. I had a huge ego that I was like, I can handle a new baby, a, a one-year-old baby, a, a full-time job remotely and work on this business that's been growing and doing well. I, I, before I had the full-time job, I had 3,000 members of Better Sheets. I had all this stuff going from, but I couldn't see it from my own point of view. And it all fell apart. Right? Like My ego got the best of me. And uh, so the side projects, I think, are better because, one, you can take, take them up, put them down. They're built like that. They're built to be nights and weekends, asynchronous. Um, but also they should be adding value to a main thing. Um, in better, in better sheets, it's like, yeah, it's a sort of a hodgepodge of many things. It's a course. It's actually a bunch of videos. Then there are courses within that. Then there's products that I also build. And, the, and so I launch those products separately, but it all leads back. It's all branded better sheets, better sheet. Like you go to only sheets.xyz and it says uh, an experiment by better sheets. If you buy only sheets, you get an email and I'm like, hey, I make better sheets. Like everything builds on this main thing. Even after I learned Ruby on Rails last year and built a SaaS finally after like a decade of trying, um, the SaaS that I built was a coupon maker. So, and it was only, I only built it because I needed to post like 10 new products onto AppSumo Marketplace <laughs> and I needed 5,000 yeah unique one-off coupons for each product. So it's like, I'm going to be sitting here on Gumroad clicking like unique products, uh, unique coupons 5,000 times for 10 products. And I was like, I don't want to do that. So I made a SaaS product that does that in one click, you can make 5,000 coupons. But like, Jeez. yeah, you look at that and you're like, oh, that's a portfolio of small bets. You think, oh, this is, might work out. I'm like, no, I, I just needed this thing so I could sell my Google Sheets on AppSumo Marketplace. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe we should call it a portfolio of compounding side projects, right? Yeah, compounding. <laughs> so, and I, side projects even sound like ter like a like my side my side uh, woman. Like it sounds like a bad thing, but like side projects should be I, uh, great. Like I love how um I think it's Peter Levels who talks about like making products as marketing. Um, John Young Fook mm -hmm. with Banner Bear has done that too, showing off the how to use Banner Bear and creating a product that then you can, every marketing part of that product is marketing for your main thing. Yeah, that's the whole building in public thing, which is mm -hmm. what Peter Levels is, you know, <laughs> the king of, right? We all kind of look to him in the, at least in the startup and solopreneur kind of space because he's killing it, right? Yeah. So the one thing I wanted to, um, go even deeper on was this idea of compounding because to me that's the biggest reason to not do the um, portfolio of small bets approach if in the definition of doing different projects for different audiences in different uh, markets right because I see a lot of builders who have the ability to do no code or like Google Sheets like yourself or whatever it might be they they can code they can make things and they you know, there's so many people in the last two years that have done like, I'm going to do six projects in six months, or I'm going to do 12 projects in 12 months. And then I see them abandon a project and an audience for that project after it's built. And I'm going, what are you doing? Um, so my approach has been very similar to how you approach uh, Better Sheets in that when I decided I was going to kind of go all in on this Craftsman creative thing, because it for me was a side project up until about last summer. Um, I had produced 13 videos for different creators and two of my own courses. 
it had made like $65,000, which to me was not bad during a pandemic to have a side project, bring in some money. Great. And I split the revenue 50, 50 with all the course partners on there. Cause I produce all this stuff for free up front. And then we just split it on the back end. So decent revenue for me during the pandemic, which Very was nice. nice. And then um, I kind of went all in when I decided I was going to write my book back in August. And at that moment I said, okay, I know that the content of a book could easily spawn a course, a live cohort thing, a community, other books, coaching, consulting, all this stuff. So mm -hmm. before I even started writing the first word, I first mapped out a strategy of how am I going to build all this stuff? How is it going to compound and feed into one another? And then what's the path that people can take to get into this world of products that I've created? And the way that I approached it was very strategically building one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So I did the book first, and then I did a course, and then I just announced a live course that I'm supposed to be wrapping up like next month, but no one signed up and I'll probably abandon it because I have way too much other stuff to do. So I'll do it in like September or something. But what was crazy is, you know, you talk about this idea of compounding or using your building products as marketing in the process of writing the book. So before it was released, before I was even putting it up for pre-sale or anything like that, I had people reaching out to me for coaching, for consulting, for whatever. I sold $12,000 worth of coaching and consulting before I put the book on the market. 12,000, that's in like four months of time that I was working on the book actively. And then I took two months off because I was producing a movie and I came back and I started selling early access to the community, to the courses, to the book and sold like 30 people on that. And then when the book launched, I had a whole bunch of people buy the book. And so what's crazy is like, this actually works. I'm not someone who has one of those unfair advantages of having a, a huge audience of hundreds of thousands of people online. I don't have a massive email list, but like this is a six figure business that exists now because of this principle of compounding. Because when people join my newsletter, which is the single entry point that I try to get people into the world of Craftsman and Creative, then they automatically will get fed whatever it is that they're interested in. They don't get sold anything because I don't use the newsletter for selling my audience. I use it to provide value and to teach them and educate them and help them replicate what I'm doing, which is being a creator, making enough money to support a family. And so if they click on a link that says, if you want to learn more, click here, they click on it. And then I send them more stuff. And at the very end of that, maybe there's an opportunity to buy a book or a course or sign up for coaching or whatever, but only because they asked for it, not because I'm shoving them through some sales funnel. So what's crazy is that even with a small audience, my email list even is still under 2000 people. There's a six figure business there with that small of an audience. If you use this principle of compounding where all of your different products can feed one another, can you know, build on one another, that the marketing for one actually is marketing for all of them, et cetera, et cetera. And I really, I like it, it pains me a little bit when I see people go, all right, now on to my next one. I'm like, no, you just spent a whole month of effort building this thing. Now you're going to go and make something else for like farmers or something. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm going to take a breath because I've just like, that was a lot of words I just spewed out. <laughs> Rant over. Um, yeah, but people don't know where yeah, to start. I think, um, I think it's an insecurity. I think it's also a lack of information, right? Lack of role models, lack lack of a model to see what worked and what didn't. Um, thankfully, I don't need much of a role model. Like, I need just a little inkling, like, this could potentially work. Um, so my pricing model when I launched, so April 2020, I launched uh, Better Sheets. And the launch didn't necessarily go well. I, <laughs> the first month I had less than a dozen sales. Um, and but, but the point was that it was a business model where it was one payment only. And I was reading like a, I read a, reset, a pricing in a recession article that said like you have to make your pricing very specific and uh, make people feel secure about your pricing. Like subscriptions are going to be the first thing that people don't buy or they – they discontinue because even $5 a month is $60 a year. People do the math. Um, and so I was like, well, then I'm just going to do one time payment forever. 
Like, you never have to pay me again. And at that particular time, April 2020, when the world is uncertain, we don't know what's happening. We don't know how, <laughs> if our business is going to work out. We don't, we don't know if we're getting fired, laid off. Um, I thought get sensibility and, and get uh, security in the pricing. Um, and it wasn't just that, though. It was also the fact that MakerPad did this before me. They, they did, uh, Ben Tosso did it like a year or two before, had one price, and his reasoning was the exact same reasoning as mine, where I was like, this is a side project. I don't know if it's going to be successful, and I don't really want to be on the hook to continue putting out a product or, or videos or, or anything if I don't want to or if there's nobody there. If, sort of the killer of a project is like you charge $10 a month and three people sign up. And you're like, well, someone bought it. And like, I'm getting $30 a month for it. I, there's something here. Um, and, and you mentioned like people who create six projects in six months or 12, uh, 12 startups in 12 months. We have some great examples of those. We have some incredible role models who have turned out to be incredibly successful. Peter Levels, Andre Asimov. John Young Fu, like these are incredibly successful people who have ended up selling SaaS or running a SaaS for millions of dollars. Like these are incredibly successful people. So that story is going to be told over and over and over again. And it's the power law at work every single day. Uh, there are three examples <laughs> and there's hundreds of people trying it. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, like you, but then people get stuck. I, I, I have a, a good friend who uh, I just talked to. He launched his second project in two months. And then he went back to his first and tried working on it again. And I, and I was like, yeah, I was working on better sheets. I made coupon code maker. I went after six months, I went back to try to fix it. I'm like, oh, I, I lost all the, my train of thought on here. I lost it. And then I talked to um, John Youngfolk and I was like, man, how did you work on like like these projects f one after another and go back to them he's like i didn't go back to them i was like oh you never said that in all of your on all the rest of <laughs> oh that's how you did it you you that part out, man. <laughs> oh i get it okay yeah this is hard this is hard to run these different things and yeah it, a modicum of success is actually a big failure because it's going to waste your time uh it's going to waste your energy it's going to waste your focus Yeah, no, I love that. So maybe talk to me a little bit about this idea of when to charge, because I see a lot of people who are building, 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 building forever. And I think we could even wrap in a question of like, how much do you need to be marketing or audience building while you're also building in public um, and working on your product? Because at some point, you got to have people who want to buy your thing like this recent launch I did of a live cohort based course, you know, I did an announcement over a couple of days, announced it a few times and didn't really get a response. Didn't get any signups. I priced it high because I wanted to be like, if even one or two people buy it's worth my time because <laughs> it's like a two week live course. And I, I saw it as an experiment and I'm totally fine if it sells zero right now, because it means to me that my audience isn't there yet. I don't have a large enough audience or enough trust or enough demand from that audience for this product, but that's a product that exists that I can make uh, at any time because it's a live course. So I didn't even have to like create and film and edit videos. I was just like, hey, I'm going to do this thing if you want in, sign up. But talk to me a little bit about your approach to pricing, to charging, to uh, and like how does that play into the size of your audience and how much time you should be focusing on building that audience. And before you dive in, so it looks like we got like four people in the audience. I actually don't know if they're here on Riverside or if they're watching on like Facebook or YouTube. So hi, wherever you are. Um, if you are on Riverside, um, there should be a button. I was researching this. There should be a button for you to like do a live call in. So click that button and we'll talk to you as well. And you can ask questions of us about any of the thing we've discussed tonight. Um, if I can't figure out where that button exists on my end to like accept you. I apologize, but and there's a try it. Let's see how it works. There's a, a text <laughs> chat too over on the All right. side, right? I, I don't think anyone's in it. There is a text chat on the right side. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. So I said, feel free to post your questions here, and no one's responded. So we'll see if it happens. They're just <laughs> enjoying the conversation. That is also okay. So yeah, talk to me about charging and talk to me about audience building. My God, that's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, well, I think the number one mistake that people make right now in online business is not charging. Uh, there is a there's a few particular things at play here. One, people will always uh, people will always say information wants to be free. Okay, sure, but our time is not free. Our our energy, our focus is not free. Uh, my baby has to eat formula, and there's a shortage of formula in the U.S. right now. I'm not in the U.S., so I'm okay. Uh, and he's getting older, so he's eating apples and stuff now. Okay, I got to buy a lot of apples. <laughs> apples still cost something, even though <laughs> apples come from the tree and they're free, but somebody's got to go pick them. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, the number one mistake I, I find is people not charging uh, anything. And, and I made the same mistake. I'm not saying I'm at a, I'm a, a, a god amongst men here. I am a, a mortal man. If, if you cut me, do I not bleed? Uh, I bled a lot. I bled all over 2019. It was a hard year because I didn't charge. I was creating a SaaS product that was for creators. It was a growth um a growth tool to analyze your growth on Instagram based on what you're doing. And I had an unfair advantage. I had clients. I had an agency that I was doing growth hacking for Instagrammers, Twitter uh, people. I was growing them month after month, two to 5,000 new followers a month. And I, I knew the business. I, I had customers, uh, but I was like, you know, Instagram's going to change their policies. I need to have like a product that I can give to, I also wanted to scale. I wanted thousands of people to be able to use sort of the tactics and the knowledge that I was gaining out of this. Um, and so I made a SaaS product. I created, I, I hired a designer, hired a developer, made it. We launched it within three months. It was really quick to make because I had been thinking about this for like five years. Um, and yeah, I ended up six months later, 200 users zero dollars in revenue why because i didn't charge for it how stupid of me <laughs> like why didn't i charge also at the end i was like i'm just gonna give this up like i'm, I'm just gonna stop it i was like why didn't i just like say hey email the 200 people be like you want to start paying 15 bucks a month for this yes or no like i was so scared i was so like emotionally distraught that like this thing wasn't working people weren't using it and i was like I'm not talking to users, even though I was like working one on one with with people to grow their account. I'm not talking to users for this product. I'm not charging anything. Like I'm doing everything wrong here. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I see it a lot um, with my artist friends, my musician friends. Um, you can't see it because my camera's not pointing this way anymore, but I have a picture on the wall over here on the side that's like a a collage of like 30, 40 different musician friends that I worked with when I was doing live sound at Belor Live Music Gallery here in Provo, Utah. <laughs> uh, for 10 years, I was like a live sound engineer there. And when the pandemic hit, a lot of them really struggled mm -hmm. because they didn't have uh, different ways to charge. So this is kind of expanding this conversation of charging. Mm -hmm. um, they knew how to charge for gigs and they knew how to charge for their music. Um, but when the pandemic hit, all the gigs went away. So what did mm -hmm. they do? Well, they went online and they went on Facebook and live streamed and asked people to send them 20 bucks over Venmo. It's like, okay, yeah, but mm -hmm. that's not a business. That's a that's begging, right? That's, that's please help me, please support me. It's not an offer. It's not mm -hmm. a a product that you've put together thoughtfully. And so I've tried to give this a lot of thought over the last two years because I feel like I needed to figure it out myself as well, especially when I started doing the whole, like I'm a creator thing and I'm not just a freelance film producer, but like, okay, if I'm going to write a book, how am I going to get people to pay for that book? Um, interestingly enough, I put it online for free as I was writing it. So every chapter I published as a blog post, and put it up there for free, knowing that 
the emails I was collecting would provide revenue down the line. And I was in a privileged position to not need to make money off of that stuff immediately. Mm -hmm. um, going back to my friends, though, like it's the couple of people that I went to lunch with and talked to them about their businesses, I said, look, you need to figure out how to give value to people in different ways um, now that the world has changed, right? Who knows when the, the events are going to pop back up? Can you start a community? Can you make more music uh, digitally and remotely with other friends? You know, Postal Service did it back before <laughs> the internet was around. They were literally mailing yeah. CDs and discs back to each other with like a new track added to the previous three tracks. And then they would add vocals and mail it to someone else. And they'd add beats and they'd mail it back and add it to someone else. You know, like, and the people that did that, I have uh, one friend who's on this poster who we talked to. And he really doubled down on licensing mm -hmm. and he took his huge library of music that hadn't been recorded. And he spent a week and started recording all of his songs with different producers in different studios. And then he started putting them out into the world for licensing. And he had the best year ever last mm -hmm. year because his stuff was getting picked up by dude. Perfect. And put on their <laughs> on their videos that have 10 million views and people go and check out his music mm -hmm. and they buy it. Right. And he was getting placed on different um, compilations albums. He was getting his music picked up by other artists to record on their albums because he shifted and he realized, okay, I have to charge money, which means I need a product and an offer and an audience. And those three things together are what equal revenue, right? You have to have a good enough product, a good enough offer and an audience who's willing and able to pay you for it. And ideally, you've got more demand than you have supply, which is an interesting thing we could talk about when it comes to digital products. How do you do that? But I, I, all of this is to say I completely agree with you in that if you feel that art is such a precious thing that it has to be free or that or you have this belief or this mindset that people aren't going to pay you for it because they can get free versions of the same thing elsewhere, mm -hmm. well, you know, that's not a helpful mindset to approach your your creative business with, because one of the things I talk about a lot with the book and the, the content I put out is that to succeed, you have to kind of shift from thinking like an artist or a creator or a freelancer to a business owner. And what does a business owner have to think of? They have to think of profit margin. They have to think of, you know, customer acquisition cost yeah. and marketing Absolutely. and sales and <laughs> systems and all this stuff. That creators kind of, you know, creators hate spreadsheets. But so I've been told that <laughs> a dozen times. Yeah, it's hard but to think of a, a business. The difference between, go ahead. It's yeah. hard to think of your creative work as a business. And I think that mm -hmm. going one step above yourself is hard for 99.9% .9 of creators and creatives. That's why I think maybe go down a step instead of saying, and, and actually, just what you mentioned, I was literally going to like say pretty much your anecdote, but for everyone is like, you don't know your unfair advantage, right? As a musician, you're creating original music from yourself. You are playing everything, uh, whatever it is you play, but you maybe you, you play multiple instruments and you create your entire creative work yourself. Um, your unfair advantage, though, is that not everybody plays guitar. Not everybody plays drums. Uh, there are people out there seeking music, but maybe not your music. Like, not the the total creative output that you do. They're not seeking that, but they're seeking to license soundtrack. They're seeking to license beats. Uh, some of the biggest music entrepreneurs in the last five years are beat makers. People who don't make the hits, but make the beats for the hits. Um, we've seen this multiple times with hit songs made from beats where they bought the beats on a beats marketplace. Like <laughs> They literally went and bought them. Um, and so stripping away what you do, and, and, and uh, this is so hard for creatives, right? You, you think that the creative output is the creativity. You think that like the total creation of everything is all the work, sweat, equity, emotions that I put into this. This is what's valuable. When like, if you break it down step by step and piece by piece, maybe that guitar lick is the most valuable thing you'll ever do in your entire life. Like this one guitar lick, like 
Dick Dale has made a career. For, I think he's been a career for seventy years off of surf rock. Like one, you you hear surf rock, and that's Dick Dale. And like every surf rock record is Dick Dale. Um, and so like maybe breaking it down, and again, this is so hard for creatives when you're like the total whole is the creative work. And, and that's what I'm doing at Better Sheets, right, is breaking it down into different elements and figuring out after two years. I'm like, yeah, maybe this total whole is good for a few people. But if I can break down into elements like, okay, I know how to code Google Script. Not many people do. Vast majority of people don't. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can code a line of Google Script in like five minutes. I've done it before. Don't, don't bet against me there. Um, and that one line of code might be useful for a hundred thousand people, and they'll pay five dollars, ten dollars, they'll pay a hundred dollars for one line of code. We see this at Code Canyon. People are buying code all the time. Ninety-nine bucks for code. Um, they might not buy a template because they see a template gallery on Google Sheets, and they're like, "Oh, all these templates are free. I can just pick one of those." And I'm like, "Well, what about using?" What happens when you're already made a Google Sheet and you don't need a template to start, but you need to add something on top of that? So I created Atomic Sheets, which is like different types of sheets that you add after the fact, that you can add an element, you can add a landing page to a Google Sheet. Um, how do you sell access to a Google Sheet? Like, oh, I wrote the code for that, and I have the videos on how to install that. Like, those are all the different parts and elements and breaking it down and, and twisting it apart and then twisting it to see all the use cases that someone might want to sell a Google Sheet might not want to know how to build one. They already know how to build one, so they don't need my membership. They just need this one line of code. And that's the same, I think, with musicians and any creative can do that. Any creative person can do that. They might not be able to. Might not be. It's hard. <laughs> oh, it is hard. And I think one of the hard parts that you've surfaced here is like, you don't know what your unfair advantage is. I'm not sure if I want to push back on that. I'm actually like sitting with that as you're saying it, because I feel like when I sat down and said, I'm going to do crafts and creative, I'm going to make these courses. It was very specifically because I knew, or at least whatever knowledge I had at the time of it, I knew that was my creative advantage. I, I could do video, I could produce, I could edit, I could I could do enough website stuff to make a site and have it. How all did you know right? that? So how? Yeah. Didn't, dude, weren't you already working as a video producer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people paid you that yeah. those salaries and that money you made, that was validation that you could do production work, right? Yeah. So I guess my question is, if you don't know what your unfair advantage is, what are you supposed to do about that? I don't know. And my initial thought is, you know, you, you do something <laughs> and see if it works and see if you enjoy it. I, I'm a big fan of like chasing what excites you and what makes you happy. I don't think it's about um, discovering passion or anything like that. Passion's a weird word, but like, it's really easy to track joy. Like, mm -hmm. does this thing that I just spent an hour on, was it arduous or was it fun? Um, did it make me happy or did it make me like never want to sit in front of a computer again? And so that can be a, a guiding principle of sorts. But what do you think when, because that's a, I think that's a bold statement to say, you don't know what your unfair advantage is. So, okay, then what do you do? I think it? passion sucks. I'm passionate about a lot of things. I, I I'm, I'm passionate about a lot of things that won't make me any money. I'm passionate about drinking a cup of coffee and I'm <laughs> not going to start a coffee shop anytime soon. Um, I've been thinking about it for a few years. I went and learned how to roast at a coffee farm. I, I visited a coffee farm for two days. I learned how to roast and I'm like, oh, I'm going to make a coffee shop. No, don't follow your passion. You stupid idiot. Like don't, don't like <laughs> passion will, will drive you up a wall. I think it was passion that drove Odysseus on his, the Odyssey. Wait, was it Odysseus? No, Ulysses. Oh my God. <laughs> Ulysses. Wait, how how long was that? Forty years? <laughs> I don't know. Sure, some passion is great, right? Passion's great. It got Moses through the desert. It got Gandhi through. I forgot what Gandhi went through, but you know, passion's fine for some people. Passion's good for preachers, um, but not for creators. Not for 
creatives, uh, passion's gonna suck the energy out of you when like you don't get validated and you don't get paid. Um, you know, I have this weird mm. anecdote that's like a a, here, a story of a story. Um, do you know RoboCop? Mm -hmm. he, Peter Weller? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Peter Weller, the actor, Peter Weller, RoboCop himself, went and like got a master's degree or a PhD in Italy for like a Renaissance art. And he tells the story of like, people are like, what, why are you getting this like degree in Renaissance art? Like you're RoboCop, go, go and act. Like what, what, what is going on here? And he's, he, he taught, he told this story that there was, he'd never in, in his life, he had been an adult and he never liked art. He never got into art. He didn't understand art. But he went to an art gallery showing once. And there was this owner of the gallery who, this little woman who loved Peter Weller. Peter Weller, oh, hey, took him by the hand and, and, and took him to each and every painting and told him the story of, like, the painting and the artist and, and everything behind it. And it was that one experience, that one time of understanding and learning each and every piece of these paintings in this one gallery that he knew he was like, Oh, now that I know I'm passionate about it. That's how his passion started for art. And that's how he ended up getting a master's or a PhD in like Renaissance art and, and going to Italy for years and studying this. Um, you don't know what you, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know what you love. You love what you know. And being inside of something and understanding it is far different than like being passionate about it. And that's a, that's a, sizable problem to overcome for our, our generation of uh, we, we have a lot of stimulus and a lot of passion we share our passions on instagram on tiktok on youtube we share our passion all the time and we think that passion is good like sometimes knowledge is really better yeah man i love that so with the few minutes we have left, I haven't seen any questions pop up. So I want to add one thing to that conversation because it's something I've been thinking about. Um, and I'm just now connecting the dots between like the unfair advantage and, and what I'm about to say, which is um, one of the transformational books for me was So Good They Can't Ignore <laughs> You by Cal Newport. And I got that book in, I think, 2017 and read it. And it, for the first time, I was like, oh, I know what I've been doing wrong for the last 10 years and why this whole creative business thing isn't working. And I've written about this a bunch, so you can go over to the blog and, and read the most recent post. It was about this. And his solution, he calls the craftsman mindset. And it's literally the reason why I call my business Craftsman Creative, um, because he talked about this craftsman mindset, mm -hmm. which is a focus on outcomes rather than inputs. So a lot of artists say, well, I'm a musician, and I play piano, so in order to make more money, I'm going to do more art. I'm going to play piano more. I'm going to get better at my craft. I'm going to write more songs, whatever it might be. Instead, you could think of it from an outcome perspective, which means what do you want your life to look like if this were to work out? And what I did at that point was I told myself, okay, well, I don't want to be in this business that I was in anymore. It wasn't working, and my business partner and I weren't pulling our, our weight and it just wasn't working out. So I left that business and I had this moment where I could say, what do I want the outcome to be? And I said, I want to be a film producer. I want to make one or two movies a year and I want to make enough money to where my family can live comfortably. And I don't have to have this like low level financial stress anymore. Cause I, for a decade I was making like 35 grand a year. And that's, I, I never broke 40 from 2007 to 2017. And then I doubled my income in 2018 and doubled it again in 2019 mm. and made more money in 2020 and 2021. So this, this actually works for one, but I knew what the outcome was. And then I reverse engineered my way to it. So I said, okay, if I'm going to produce one or two movies a year, well, I need people who can hire me to know that I exist and to trust me enough to hire me. So I started making connections and I started reaching out to people and I started showing my work when I was producing this TV show and posting pictures. And like all of a sudden people started seeing me as, as a producer and I started getting calls and to produce pilots and to produce other features and things like that. And here we are. Now I'm going to go make a movie in South Africa of all places because someone, a friend of mine who I've known for a decade, who's never called me or hired me called me because he said, Hey, you've been doing a lot of producing lately. It's like, yes, I have. So directly I'm proving this, 
point, this methodology of think of the outcome that you want for yourself, for your creative life and business, and just work backwards from that. What do you need in order to have that outcome be realized? So I think uh, we probably should wrap up uh, for two reasons. One, it's almost been an hour, but I also have to take my son to soccer track. Oh, no. Um, And I'll be quick as a response. um, And we got a question. I know. We have a question? Yeah, let, let me uh, let me respond. Oh my gosh, we have a question in the chat. You, Let's do it. But you mentioned, before we go to the question, you mentioned that so good they can't ignore you, which I love Cal Newport. I love his ethos. And I'm like literally waiting. I I think I have the book somewhere and I'm going to read it. Um, but for a book recommendation on how to launch something, like how to create an online product, I think this is the best book possible. Launch by Jeff Walker. I also have Zero to One here by Peter Thiel, which I haven't read yet. But like for this is for startups. If you want to create a billion dollar business, this is if you want to feed your family this year. Uh, Launch by Jeff Walker. This I read this last year uh, in and 20 bucks, I think less than $20. I think you can buy this online on Kindle for $2. And it made me $1,000 in the first month. Uh, I did exactly what he says. I, I did nine email. All it was was emails, send nine emails, ask questions and create a workshop based on the questions that you get. Um, you mentioned people were calling you and asking for help to produce. This is this framework, like, and literally the emails that he has there send, uh, everybody should have, if they're watching this, I don't know, you're at least 20 years old, 30, 40 years old, you have at least 100 people and their email addresses that you know, email them this framework, and and you'll make money within a month. Yeah, 100% agree that I read that book right before I started launching my courses in 2020. And two months later, we did 10 grand in sales. That's so funny. We used emails and news. Use the same strategy on Instagram mm-hmm. as opposed to email because she had an email list of like 200 people, but her Instagram was 11,000. Yeah. She said, Great, let's use that same framework, but just do it through Instagram yeah. stories and QAs and lives, and it worked great. So, yeah, this is amazing. We have one question from Ross here. I caught the start of this, but do you think the juggling of video creation helped your outlook approach to starting your own business slash side project while keeping balls in the air? Um, you want to answer that one? I think it applies to both of us, right? Video. <laughs> and so side I think the question is, um, I don't know what he meant by juggle. So juggling create video creation. What do you think he means by that? I I wonder if he's saying, um, do you think that your video creation background informed like the the side projects and uh, and helped support you? For me, like having a full-time income from film producing where I make a six figure revenue every year from whether it was TV or now it's film. Um, then these side projects don't have to generate income immediately. So it takes some of the financial pressure off, which for me is a huge, Mm -hmm. uh, thing that I do consciously. Like I try to keep, um, Oh, there we go. Multiple moving parts and bringing it all together. So yeah, for me, it helps to have the financial aspect taken care of so that these side projects can become whatever they're going to be. And as soon as you put the financial pressure on them, to me, it kind of like kills the vibe. Well, I'm going to take the opposite. Like stepping on a flower before, but I want to hear your story. That's so funny. I, I think the pressure, pressure makes diamonds. Um, without pressure, you don't, know what's validated right and that's why i think charging from the outset is the the right way to go now by the way like i I have a freemium model you have a freemium model free newsletter i have a free newsletter i have free videos i have a youtube channel free 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 i have a bunch of free stuff but like i didn't start that way like the the day i launched it was uh, actually sort of I, i did that it was eight videos four for free four were paid um but i keep a lot of stuff behind the paywall and and building more and more, um, but I think that if a side and and I'll, I'll use my own experience and I won't like talk generally. I'll, I'll say, in the last two years, I didn't take 
better sheet seriously. I didn't take this side project seriously because I set it up as a side project. I knew I could pick it up and take it every where I went, I could take it with me. I could do it from anywhere in the world. I've still been trying to work in Antarctica. If anybody wants to sponsor me as a trip to Antarctica to work as a, I can do that. Uh, um, <laughs> um, and it was after the horrible 2019 where I made very little money and then a pandemic to like get me to like settle down. Like you got to make some money. Uh, you've got a fee and then having a, a family, right. Having a kid and being like, I gotta, he's going to have to pay for college. Uh, well, he's, I have to pay for his college. I have to pay for braces. Sam Parr is hilarious in this is like, do you want your kid to have braces? Go get down and work. Like braces are expensive. Um, <laughs> like, I think young, I'll, I'll use another example. Young Fu, John Young Fu, who made Banner Bear. Like you can, you can see him. He, he he says this publicly, so I'm not like outing him in any way. He's like, there's this long line of like a flat revenue, and then his savings is dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. And then he's like, oh shit! And then you see like revenue come up, and you're like, oh, that's because the savings was going down. <laughs> like, um, I think yeah, it will m m change your change your thinking uh appropriately most of the time and i say these as like these are wins there are probably definitely a lot of people who will see all their savings crash to zero refinance their home run run themselves into the ground and then go back and get a full-time job and great that you found your thing <laughs> go do that like I, I i have no ill will to people who try a creative work fail and then are like you know i would rather i would rather work for buzzfeed than have my own youtube channel great go work for a machine that's going to take your work and push it to two million people like go go build something with a team of people like if that's what you need to do that's what you need to do go work at facebook and, and do facebook video do that build a massive engine together there are just some people who are like i'd rather do it alone in my way <laughs> everybody's different yeah, I hear that. Okay. Um, I don't know if that was the answer. Yeah, I, <laughs> wait, that was the I, answer. I don't either. <laughs> Poor guys. But like, I've personally strategically done that in the past, where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna force this thing. I'm like, I'm gonna put myself in a situation where this has to make money, or else I'm really screwed. And I've ended up screwing myself. So, <laughs> right. Uh, it's for me. It it it's not something I recommend to people, but I I can certainly uh, agree that it can work. Uh, it's just not the strategy that I promote to people. When he says multiple moving parts and bringing it all together, um, I think it goes back to what we were talking about, this portfolio of small bets. It's much better if all of your stuff kind of becomes this web of interconnected, interdependent things that, you know, work on one benefits the rest as opposed to having these siloed different yeah. projects and businesses and stuff like that. So um, for me, rather than going and learning how to code and creating some SaaS business, I went just a little bit adjacent to filming, film and TV production. And I started producing video courses. It's almost identical to what I was doing, just shorter time frame and different content. So I think um, there's a huge benefit to that because you, you're not having to start from scratch. I, from me saying, hey, I'm an educator and I write blogs and blah, blah, blah. Now I'm creating courses for people. It was a logical step um, yeah. in a in a similar direction for my audience, as opposed to a diversion and going, what, what's he doing over here? Making a SAS for, you know, farmers. I don't know why I keep using farmers, I mean, but there we go. To take this, take this analogy <laughs> um, to it, to take this analogy to its like nth degree, right? There's different types of juggling to learn how to juggle. You, you throw one ball in the air and you catch it in your hand. And that's how you start a business. You do one, you do one thing, catch it, do it add another thing, add two more, you're juggling, right? Um, but you can also go into juggling five, six, seven balls. I, I, know I know people who've juggled five balls. It's possible. I've seen professional jugglers juggle 10 balls, uh, nine balls. Like it's possible, but they didn't start out that way. They didn't uh, say, I'm going to juggle nine balls, put nine balls in their hands and start juggling. They, they started with one. Um, that's... A weird thing to <laughs> yeah no i love that analogy like all right so 
Andrew, this has been amazing, and I'm so glad we had a chance to connect this way. Where where you direct people? Where can they find you online? And what do you want them to go check? Yeah, out? check out BetterSheets.co. It's my Google Sheets course, membership, products, templates, everything. Um, but also, if you just are interested in the journey, if you're interested in coming along and seeing how it's going. Uh, and asking questions, then Twitter's the best way to find me. Twitter.com slash Camphy. It's my last name. And uh, I'm pretty open. I'm happy to share a lot of stuff. Uh, I share my revenue on Indie Hackers continually. I share milestones of number of members. I share even how much money I made, which is like roughly less than half of my total revenue. Um, and there's one weird thing that happens though when you I don't I don't know if you find this on Twitter and I would love to like nip it in the bud if I can is that people will ask me really serious like odd questions by DMs thinking that like I don't want to reveal the answer publicly but I am actually much much more interested in answering questions publicly so that other people can learn if you're if you're scared and you think like oh I don't know if he'll answer this question I don't know if like the answer is something he wants to reveal just ask it in a public forum like a reply to a tweet or just tag me I will be much happier to answer things publicly so that people can learn from it because other people are going to be scared to ask that question too I I sort of get really snippy in DMs when they're like what's the secret I'm like you think I'm going to tell you the secret in DMs and also there is no secret just do the thing. <laughs> Yeah, just keep going for a long enough period of time and stay focused. So You're so good they can. Amazing, man. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time tonight. Sorry, what was that? Be so good they can't ignore you. <laughs> That's the secret. Yes, that is the answer. That's the secret. Amazing. Thanks for your time tonight. Uh, everybody go check out Campy's stuff online. And thanks for okay. listening. We'll see you on the next one.